Hey, sweetie, I miss Everything you do is so good Everything you do is beautiful You are never late, you on time When it comes to me, you go all out You go in no left or right Only your word is true, I'm choosing no black or right Only your love is real, I'm going no left Praise the Lord, everybody. One more time for everybody in the room. Say, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Amen. Are you ready to, uh, to worship with us this Sunday? Come on now, stand on your feet, clap your hands, act like you want to be here. Amen. We love to see it. Come on, put your hands together this morning with us. I'll 
praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when Report. 
Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord this morning in this place. You guys know what time it is. For those of you who don't know what time it is, it's time for us to release our kids and our youth to their teachers on there in the back so they can get to know who it is that we believe in and why it is that we believe 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. So here. Kids love us. I know. I'm sorry. Theo, I'm walking up here, and Theo is like, take me to class. I was like, buddy, 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 I got to go. All right, y'all go ahead and grab a seat. Grab a seat. Take a load off your feet. Thank you. Thank you. Take a seat. Grab a seat. Take a seat. Whatever. Uh, I want to invite a couple of families up. You know who you are. Can I get the, uh, the Albuquerque's? Elena, you take your side. Can you pick this side or this side? Pick a side. And then I need the bakers to come on up here. Can I get the Albuquerque's and the bakers? Albuquerque's on this side. You going to be up here by yourself? I'm just playing. Anybody that's here with you can also come up. If you got family and friends, if you got life group, they can come on up. Just create a little crowd over here. It's going to be awesome, a little huddle. And we got the baker crowd coming right over here family, friends, life group. Look at this. Jonah is doing it to me. And if you're wondering, this is baby dedication. And if you're thinking, we have one baby, but two families, sweet Liliana will be here shortly. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll pace ourselves. And while I'm up here, there's going to be the communion being passed out. So the bread and the juice is going to come your way. So we ain't in a hurry. We're here, you know. When you're in a hurry, you worry. So let's all just stop. Let's just pause. Ain't got good. He's so good. Wow. Thank you, Andy. Wow. Levi, are you going to come up here with Jonah? Do you want to come up here for Jonah? Come on up, man. You're doing a great thing. This is great. Come on up. Yeah, heck yeah. I love it. Okay. So, pause for effect. No, I got plenty. I got plenty over here. So uh, before we get into this, let me tell you a little bit about baby dedication, and then I want the crowds to introduce themselves a little bit. But we do baby dedication as a function of a moment in discipleship. This is a milestone moment in the life, not only of, of, the, of the child, but of the parents. This is our opportunity as the family of God to come together and to recognize that God has blessed us with a new child, whether they came through birth or through adoption, however they come to us, that God has brought a gift to our family. We see something about this in Psalm 127, verse 3, where it says, Sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a reward from Him. Who do babies come from? parents, but also, I know, it's kind of like squirt, uh, the Sunday school answer, like, Jesus. It's like, well, they come from parents. However, they also come from God. This is a moment for us to say thank you to God. Amen? It is also a moment for us to, uh, to thank Him, but also to say we as parents are going to, going to commit this baby and ourselves to you, God. We don't want to just say thank you and we've got it from here. We want to say we actually don't got it from here. <laughs> no way. Please, God, be with us, help us as we try and train up this child in a way that honors you. Deuteronomy 6 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts and press them on your children, on your babies. Talk about these things when you sit at home, when you, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and 
when you get up, morning and evening, resting or, 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 or traveling, impress God and his commands on your family. Ephesians 6 says something similar. Parents, don't provoke your children to anger, but instead bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. So that's what we're doing here. And as we wait, we will do this always, but also as a function of helping us wait. Let's introduce the Baker side of the family. Which one of y'all wants to take the microphone and say who's standing up here with you? I'm talking, you got like a minute, tops. You don't have to wax eloquent. I'm Jenna. This is Jonah and Jesse. And these are my parents, Janice and Jim. <laughs> a lot of J's, not on purpose, but. Um, uh, my parents are coming from Florida for the weekend. Yes. And this is our sweet life group that we love so much. Yeah. This is Jonah. Jonah will be one next weekend. Yeah, no. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Love the bakers, love the bakers, love the Albuquerque's. You're the only one that's here, so you gotta work the mic. Tell us who's here. This is my friend Becca. This is my friend Macy. This is my mom. This is my mama Shelly. This is my dad, my father-in-law, my grandmother-in-law, my cousins-in-law who just got married at DCC. And my aunt and uncles-in-law, my friend Emery, my friend Jared, my friend Madeline, and my life group, which you know, Claire, Preston, and Donovan. My husband's coming with my child that's being dedicated. In Jesus' name. Uh, anybody travel a long way over here? Mansfield. That is a trek. That is a trek. I was uh, there. Hey, everybody say Liliana. Liliana. I love it. You're doing it, Christian. Come on in. Come on in. Oh, yeah. Look at this sweet baby. Yeah. Did you hear that? Did you hear all those oohs and ahs? That's incredible. And Christian, thank you for being here. So what we're going to do is for the Bakers and for Jonah and for the Albuquerque's and for Liliana, we're going to ask them a question, and then we're going to ask everybody a question, okay? And once again, I think that communion has been passed. Has everybody got everything? Y'all got what you need? No? All right. If you don't have communion, just raise your hand, and somebody will bring it to you. All right. So as you're getting communion elements, just, just, just jump in with me, okay? All right. So here's what we got. Bakers and Albuquerque's, do you promise to bring both Jonah and Liliana up in the training and instruction of the Lord and to model Jesus by loving God and loving others. I love it. All right. Now, thank you, Bakers. Thank you, Albuquerque's. Now, for everybody, this is for y'all as friends and family on both sides, right, but also as the church family. I want y'all to come alongside and do this thing with us. Disciple City and Co., do you promise to come alongside both the Bakers and the Albuquerque's and reinforce the training and instruction of the Lord and to model Jesus by loving God and loving others? In Jesus' name. I love it. So what we're going to do now is have a, a short time to pray. So can somebody over here, y'all just crowd around, can somebody over here pray? Got it. We're all right. I'm not going to cry over J-Man. Somebody pray for the Bakers and for Jonah. <laughs> and could somebody over here, y'all just crowd around, and will one person pray for Christian and Elena and Liliana?
Lord, we commit these families to you. They are already yours. They're a part of your family. These kids are no surprise to you, and yet we want to pause and move beyond knowing that to, to talking with you about it, to inviting you in, to yielding ourselves to you, to saying that we trust you, we're dependent upon you, we're nothing without you, and that is true for Jesse and Jenna, that's true for Christian and Elena. God, would you help them as they continue this journey of raising a child? Would you give them truth to remember constantly? Would you always bid them back to you over and over again? And would you continue surrounding them like they're surrounded now with people who care for them and will hold them up, will lift them up, will walk with them? And God, would you help these babies to know you early, that they could have life with you, we all pick up bumps and bruises. It's a little better to have you alongside of us when we do. So would you please bring these sweet kids to know you and help us as Disciple City to come alongside and make that happen. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. We all give it up. 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 Thank you guys for being up here. Y'all go grab a seat. And if you didn't get communion, I think people are so kindly offering it to you as you go sit down. Yes, of course. And what we have for you is some Disciple City Church, I don't know, swag, merch, what do you want to call it? For your kids and a Bible as you continue raising them. All right, man, I'm out your way. So as the, the families go back to the seat and get communion, we got one more thing that we want to present before you all. Make sure. Check, so, check. Um, so we de dedicated some babies um, to the Lord today, but I also want to present a family that I love, that my, the Wagner family are just, just overwhelmed because not only do we do we dedicate the babies now, but they want to take care of the babies for the future. And so I want to give the Dominguez family um, a spotlight as they talk about um, how they love on the next generation. Appreciate that. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I'm Edgar. This is my beautiful wife, Diamond. Um, some of y'all might know, but we were fortunate enough to start a scholarship in honor of my granddad. Uh, he passed away in 2015. Uh, and he was an amazing person that was very hands-on and he was almost like the, the neighborhood mechanic, you would say. No education, but still knew how to work on cars and helped everybody in the community. Um, so we thought this would be a great way to honor him uh, and then just help the next generation, like he said. Um, so the scholarship is for uh, minority high school seniors that are seeking uh, further education in STEM. Um, and the way that it works is uh, you can just go to the website there uh, and that's where they'll be able to apply. Um, and the great thing is that, you know, we have an opportunity to not just focus on their um, education, right, or, or their uh, GPA or whatever, but we can also uh, part of it is we wanted to kind of focus on how are you going to impact your community after you get your education. Uh, so we have the <clears throat> privilege to be able to select some amazing kids that we believe are going to do some amazing things in their community in the future. So, so all that to say, I guess, uh, if you know, yeah, if you know any uh, high school seniors that might be. I know uh, one. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> so, yeah. But um, well, um, can you just give just a little bit uh, more of the why? Like, so why is this? I know it's connected to your grandpa, or how do you say it in Spanish? Abuelo. Oh, okay. Could you is that, speak, what, is that, what, is that Yeah, you can speak in Spanish. But just <laughs> the why, like, why is this a legacy that the Dominguez family wants to continue and impart to the world? So, 
Because yeah. I know it, but I want them to get it. Yeah. Um, like I said, I think if, if you know me and especially Diamond, I think we are very passionate about helping others and helping our community. Um, and I think my granddad did that in a very unique way. Um, and if you would have seen when he was sick before, you know, he passed away, the amount of people from the community that would come to the house just to say, hey, just to bring some food, because it seemed like he just knew everybody. Everybody knew who he was, and everybody knew him as a good person that always was helping other people. So we wanted uh, to find an amazing way to honor that and to kind of keep that legacy alive, and this is the best way we thought we could do that. So good. Give it up for the Dominguez family. The reason why I brought that up is because not only did um, was Edgar impacted by the things that his grandfather said, but it was also by what he did, right? And we say one of the sayings around here as we continue to walk alongside parents is more stuff is caught than taught, right? More things are, in, your children will embrace more things that they see you do than the words that you say, right? And so if you want to leave a kingdom legacy, it doesn't start with just your words. It also starts with your action. Those things must come together to, to, to show off the God above and also your love for the neighbors below. Amen? All right. So uh, one of the things that our Father in heaven did was show his love towards us by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. This is Resurrection Month, right, where we get a chance to celebrate our risen king. He is not dead. When I went to Israel, I reminded everybody, everyone who was out there crying, the tomb is empty. <laughs> the tomb is empty. You, you can cry, you can rejoice, but he's not in here. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, even now, interceding on our behalf. So as we take the bread, it is a reminder that he broke his body and was crushed for our iniquities and for our peace. So repeat after me. The body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us eat. Likewise, the covenant was sealed. The covenant was ratified when his blood spilled out on behalf of on behalf of us from the cross. And so this cup represents his blood. So repeat after me. The blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us drink. Amen. Let us continue to worship our King. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Your glory, we say, high above the heavens. Bless that, bless strength. Through the mouth of infants, the enemy, the moon.
So, real quick. <laughs> um, mm, okay. So, while we were talking about all of the roles that God plays in our life, yes, this song is called Psalms 8, but it reminds me of Nehemiah 4. Um, it speaks to Nehemiah 4 for me. Um, in Nehemiah, they're trying to build the wall around Jerusalem. Well, there are some people who don't like that because for a really long time that wall has been down. And the, cre the uh, <clears throat> rebuilding that wall just means more of the establishment of who God is for the people of Israel. And during that time, those people who did not want it built would come and fight, harm, kill the people who were rebuilding the wall. So it was told to them, keep building, keep building. Half the people will be there building, the other half will be there with their weapons so that we can continue to build this wall. Now, when I read Nehemiah, it's like, God, you told them to build the wall. Why aren't you protecting them? What's going on? But there was a plan. There was a plan. So anyways, they keep, they keep going. They keep going. To the point where the people who are building the walls keep their weapons on their side. And Nehemiah 4.20 says, um, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, go ye there, because our God will fight for us. There are a lot of times, especially now, when we are doing what God is calling us to do and it feels like God is not protecting us. It's like, God, where are you? Where are you? And for me, that, that rang true since the end of January to now. It's like, where are you? I'm doing what you're calling me to do. And though I don't hear the sound of an actual trumpet, I'm not going to hear Louis Armstrong playing in the back <laughs> for me to go. It's in the little things. The how are you? It's the trumpet. What do you need? It's the trumpet. The worship here, it's the trumpet. The word being preached, that's the trumpet. So, as we go back, <laughs> there are times where I'm thinking, who am I? <laughs> that you are mindful of me. Who am I? And all of you, have been the trumpets. <laughs> Y'all have been trumpets for me because we are the body. We are those trumpets. So y'all can indulge me a little bit. <laughs> We're gonna go back into the song a little bit because he is worthy to be praised for those little trumpets that we hear every day, for the little trumpets that we get to be every day. You're worthy to be praised in your name.
We're going to read from Philippians 4. This is one of my favorite passages. It's really been on my heart the last few months, so I'm really excited to share it with you. I'll read it slow so it can percolate. So Philippians 4, we're starting in verse 6. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the peace of God will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly because once again you renewed your care for me. You were, in fact, concerned about me, but I lacked the opportunity to show it. I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know both how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Amen. Y'all can take a seat. Thanks, y'all. Thank you for singing. Thank you for playing. So good. So good. Thank you. Thanks, Hans. All the little trumpets. If you've heard some trumpets in your life recently, can you just give a little hand clap to the Lord real quick? All the times that... The technical difficulty just hits, and all the sound goes out. It's a little trumpet. The Lord's like, yo, 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 be quiet. I'm talking in the, in the whisper. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I am so glad to be with you today. So glad to be with you this morning. I'm glad that the Albuquerque's family and friends are here, this little cloud. Y'all are great. Y'all are incredible. Glad you're here. Uh, I, um, I have something that I want to tell you. I got a lot of things going on, a lot of things to be excited about. I want to see if you have something similar. Uh, man, Emmett is walking, talking. He's in City Kids right now. Brittany, are you here? Where is Brittany? She's around. Oh, she's just having a conversation kidless. Look at this. Okay. Uh, incredible. But Emmett is talking and laughing and cheesing. I wish I would have put the picture up. He's like taken to this cheese thing that he's doing. It's the sweetest. But in the middle of Emmett growing up, getting bigger, all these things, there's this like lurking, looming shadow in the corner. Theo, three and a half, has all these complex sentences, is so big and considerate. He's crushing it. He can write his name by himself. It's ugly as all get out. It don't look much different than my handwriting. Uh, but, but there's this, this shadow lurking and looming in the background. Brittany and I uh, have been doing this thing for a while, and things are really great, really sweet. We have a lot of cool things that are shaking. We're looking to move into the neighborhood this semester. And, you know, we've got sabbatical coming up this summer. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be so great. But there's this lurking, looming shadow hovering at every turn. Just started coaching. It's great. High ceilings, low floors. We're going to make it work. But there is this shadow. Do you hear what I'm saying? There is a dark figure that will not let up, has not gone anywhere. And you know this dark figure. You know this shadow. You just don't know it yet. You probably have some similar things. You've got highs that you could be celebrating. You've got the monotony, the mundane, but there might be something lurking, looming. Let me tell you what it is for me. About two and a half weeks ago, I started struggling with anxiety. This isn't a, a joke. I was scheduled to preach this sermon before this happened. But for two and a half weeks, I have had a consistent just general anxiety disorder, just kind of looming, lurking. 
My kids are cute. Oh, I can't feel my feet, you know? I don't know. It's just been a really random, my chest is tight. And so I'm just trying to figure out what's going on, what that means. I think that I've identified a couple sources. One, the pace of life right now is just a little bit too much. Brittany and I are constantly reassessing, trying to consider what could we do to slow that down. A weekly Sabbath is really doing enough. Probably need to add some other stuff. The other thing is sabbatical, which is a gift. 12 weeks, I'm not going to see none of you. You'll never see me. I'm going to be the dark shadow looming in the distance, though. Uh, but I will get to rest and rejuvenate and reconnect with God in ways that are completely disconnected from the, like, blinding pace of what ministry has been recently, which is cool. However, there's a lot of stuff that needs to get done between now and then. You know, a lot of projects in the work, different programs that need to get covered, different people that need to get considered. What do I do? And those two things, I think, have triggered the, like, constant go, go, go. I think my brain is just sending me a signal to say, something's got to give. And let me tell you, I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way. I want you to hold on to that. I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way. I'll give you one last piece. Last night, we're about to put the boys down, you know, daylight savings or whatever. <laughs> so it's like, please God, early bedtime. And I go to put Emmett in his bed, and the crib sheet is in the dryer. But like the first run through the dryer, because you got to do everything on low, and you do too many clothes at once, so you got to run it a few times through the dryer, so it's not ready yet. And I just immediately felt this crippling anxiety jump on my back like I couldn't breathe. That's what happened. This is last night. I'm coming here honest. I'm not coming up here as some expert. I'm coming up here honest. And before you go psychoanalyzing me or trying to think of a way to fix my situation, that's not my point. My point is that I want you to know that I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way. I want you to be able to say the same thing. And I bring this up not to ask you for help, though help is great. I want you to think about you. You know, this has only been two and a half weeks for me, but a sense of stress, a sense of, of anxiousness creeps up on all of us. You may have some sort of an anxiety disorder. There are many I think one in five Americans deal with an, an anxiety disorder. Women are twice as likely as men to struggle with an anxiety disorder. Last time I checked, 40% of Americans year over year are like more anxious. You ask two out of every five, and they'll be like, I'm more anxious than I was last year. Anybody in here, if you were honest, you would say, I feel a little bit more anxious today than I did two years ago, five years ago. Something's got to give. I want to encourage you. You're not there yet, but you are on your way. You may have some concerns, some worries, some stress, something that causes you to feel anxious, or you may have anxiety. What do you do about that? What is the solution? Well, I can, I can tell you I'm not here to clickbait I'm not here to tell you that I've got three steps to solving your anxiety. I'm not here to tell you that I can get you right in the next 90 days. I'm not here to really tell you much of anything other than what's true and that you can know that though you may not be there yet, you can be on your way. Say, I'm not there yet. I'm on my way. I want to answer the question. How do I develop impenetrable peace, like this peace that cannot be shaken? What does it look like for me to grow peace? What does that look like? We're going to land the plane on family ties. We're going to land the plane on Philippians. We're in Philippians 4, 6 through 13. Claire, thank you for reading it. It's also been in my um, repeat. Uh, but what Paul does is he prescribes a way that, that we can maybe see our way through worry and anxiety into peace and serenity. Not a way out necessarily, but a way through. And so today, I got three simple moves. You will face anxiety. 
I'm going to call it anxiety. I'm going to use that as a term, though it may not be clinical. Maybe you have some worry, some stress, you feel anxious, or you have clinical anxiety. Wherever you are, I'm going to say anxiety. If that bothers you, come and tell me after. I'm just going to use one term, so I'm not up here hopscotch, jump roping. We're just going to keep moving, okay? Anxiety. You will face anxiety. However, you can learn peace. This is great news. You can learn peace. Oh, and by the time we walk out of here today, I hope that you have hope because somebody in here feels hopeless. Like you can't see the way out. You can be okay, though you don't see your way out. And that's what this text is going to give us today. And last thing I'm going to do is say, how do I develop it? What does that look like? So let's start. You will face anxiety. Let's just uh, call out the dark figure in the room. Say anxiety. Okay. If you're not in a season, don't worry. It may be coming. If, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just thinking like before I had two kids, I couldn't spell anxiety. And now for whatever reason in this season, I spell it M-E. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just right here. But Paul starts chapter 4, verse 6. He says the audacity. He says, don't worry about anything. All right. I'll see you all next time. You know, <laughs> don't worry about anything. That's what he says. And at first I'm like, the audacity, you know, just like I can't believe that you would say it like anything. There's not, not even a little something, Paul. But he says, be anxious for nothing. I kind of jokingly bring this up because Paul was anxious. Even in this book, if, you're, if you have a, a text, you can just flip back or look back at chapter 2, verse 28. Look what Paul says. He says, for this reason, I'm very eager to send him, Epaphroditus, so that you may rejoice again when you see him, and I may be less anxious. So Paul is telling me not to be anxious. What, does he get a pass? What's going on here? But then again in a different book, 2 Corinthians, he's writing to them, and he says this whole list. You read the list earlier in this series, but he says this stuff that he's dealt with. I've been beaten. I've been shipwrecked. I've been hungry. I've been all of this stuff. And at the end, he says, not to mention other things, <laughs> just like Paul, dang. There's daily pressure, which is another term for anxiety, and my concern for all the churches, my anxiety for all the churches. It's the same wo uh, word that's here. So Paul says, don't be anxious, don't worry, but he has some anxiousness. He's got some worry. So you can either hear this as, well, Paul is relatable. Paul, Paul can empathize with my situation. Or you could say, Paul ain't no expert. If he's got anxiety, then what, what is he saying that's going to somehow fix something for me? I don't understand. Well, let me just say I hear you, but also who he was echoing. You may be familiar with Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is teaching, and he says, therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life. Sounds familiar? He says... What you're going to eat or drink, what, uh, what you're going to clothe your body with, isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing. That is like the anti-gospel of a place like Dallas, where we spend so much on both of those things. I'm not throwing shade. I'm just saying, if we have worries, what are they connected to? I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But Paul echoes Jesus saying, don't worry. Don't be anxious. Now, let me tell you, this is not where the, like, see through it piece comes in. This is just where he vocalized that there's a problem. Let's dissect the problem a little bit. Biblically, what he means by anxiety is that it's something that has your attention and it triggers an emotion. So something that you care about now gets a little bit more intense, there's more concern around it, maybe you worry about it, and to say worry, it might be like, well, that's negative. It just means that you're concerned, you're thinking about it. It's on your mind, and you're caught up. You want to make sure that this thing is in order. It's when something that you care about becomes a singular focus, where it crowds out other things, and it becomes weighty to you, and it starts pulling you down. That's what Paul means here in this passage. And the Christians in Philippi had plenty that they could be caring about, plenty of concerns, 
Their guy, Paul, who they love, who they are sending money to to support, is in prison. They want to know that he's okay. They have uh, uh, persecution happening. They want to know that they're okay. Also, more than that, they've got a bunch of selfishness in the church house. It's causing disunity. And they're like, man, with friends like these, who needs anemones or whatever the Finding Nemo quote is. But those things Paul knew would be like weeds, that they would grow up in their garden and that they would crowd out other things. They would push out their better intended growth. And that is no less true for us. Whether you struggle with worry or stress or feeling anxious or you have anxiety, wherever you are in that realm, the idea is that your inner world is disrupted. It is disordered. It is not as it is intended to be. It's not what God would want for you. And this may be seasonal. It may just be here to stay. Whichever it is, both of those things are attached to survival. Your brain is telling your body that if this thing doesn't get taken care of, you will die. That is what your brain is convinced about. If I don't get the dishes done, I will die. If I don't accomplish this project by this deadline, I will die. If my kid is not healthy, I will die. And so we spin our wheels trying to, to just figure out that situation. And that's, that's fine, but the problem is that we're rewiring our brains unless you already have this kind of chemical thing going on and maybe some meds could help, by no means am I gonna say anything that undermines like having less stimulants or having therapy or slowing down your, all of those things are great, probably address them a little later. But what I wanna say is our brains are being rewired because we don't just have one thing. We have one thing that we, that we focus on and then maybe we move on to the next thing and then the next thing. And our brains are constantly telling our bodies to release these hormones so that we can have the energy that we need to fight or flight, to survive. And that will slowly erode our mental health. And what I mean by mental health is like your actual brain and the way that your brain functions. Paul is addressing something that is supremely important for us, especially as Americans, the most anxious population. We are potentially killing ourselves, keeping up with the rat race, keeping up with a pace that is blinding. It is too much because I have a theory that our worry is proportionate to our hurry. We are moving at a pace that we cannot sustain, and it is causing us to develop something that has been called by psychologists hurry sickness. Hurry sickness. This is what's been said about it or how it's been defined. Hurry sickness is a behavior pattern characterized by continual rushing and anxiousness. I like this definition better. A malaise in which a person feels chronically short of time. Does anybody in here constantly feel like you do not have enough time? And so, tends to perform every task faster and to get flustered when encountering any kind of delay. Would anyone in here say, ooh, this isn't like my WebMD kick for the day, but Ryan... That sounds a little bit too close to home. I'm going to need you to move to the next point. I would posit that at least every single person in here has dealt with this to a degree. John Mark Comer said, psychologists tell us anxiety is often the canary in the coal mine. It's our soul's way of telling us that something is deeply wrong and we need to fix it fast. So what do we do? What is the way out of this? If you need to assess where you are, think about how you feel, think about how you think, think about how you behave. 
This is a psychosomatic thing. It's your brain and how you think. It's your body, how it presents. Maybe your tongue is just a little too often pressed to the roof of your mouth. Maybe your eye is twitching. Maybe you haven't let your shoulders relax in about seven to ten days. What do you do? Well, whether it's worry or anxiety, Paul urges proportionate practices to know that you will face anxiety, but you can learn peace. You can learn peace. This is what I love about what Paul says. This is what, I love this. He says, don't worry about anything. So he says, be anxious for nothing. Like, in no circumstance worry, in nothing. And then he says, but in everything. This is like so obvious. It's like if I didn't make my point clear enough, let me just emphasize a little bit. Nothing, everything. I'm like, you are annoying me, Paul. Get out of my face. It's like if a friend told you this, you'd be like, pull up then, you know? Pull up. Paul, in his apostolic authority, actually has apostolic authority. Don't forget, this dude has been through it. He's been through everything. He has suffered through just about everything that you can, and he offers a transcendent prescription. Dr. Evans, down the road, says it this way. Every time we begin to worry, we should see that as a call from God telling us that it's time to pray. I just couldn't say it better. Like, let's go home. That's incredible. And the way Paul says it is present. Present your requests to God. Present means make known. Now let me say the way that we do that. We present, we make known by prayer. Paul gives three different words for prayer. I'll say it to you like this. Paul says whether you're praying or you're praying, praying, you need to be talking to God. That's what Paul says. He says when it's normal prayer or when it's urgent prayer, we got to be talking to God. That's what he says. The, the, the way out of worry is prayer. Now, in our society, in our cultural moment, that just is like out the window. We don't even think about that for a second. I want to build on it, but please, just for the sake of argument, can you just hold on to it? Okay, let's just hold on to it. He also has the nerve to say with thanksgiving. The nerve. I'm going through it, Paul, and you're like, yeah, be thankful. Like, you, you just not, you're not hearing me, Paul. But here's what Paul is doing. Paul knows that the enemy would love to move you from being grateful to being grumpy. Like, that would, that would give him the most joy. He would throw a party if the enemy could move you from being thankful to God to being bitter or to doubting or to feeling a sense of debilitation, just being all the way defeated, all the way deflated. That's what the enemy would count as a win in your life. So if he can knock you off of being grateful, if you cannot find anything to be thankful for that God has done for you, or even just who he is, that you have access to him, that there's nothing that you have to do to come to him, if there's nothing that you can find, then the enemy maybe has a little foothold. And Paul wants to deliver you from the danger that's posed in leaving thankfulness, in leaving connection to God. Because we live in the information age. I bet that you could find out anything that you want to know in a matter of minutes. Most of you could put together this sermon and come up here and preach or present this information. You have access to this. You could find it. There's libraries. There's the internet. You could pay for stuff to get through. Pay. You could get whatever you needed. Information is there. That's part of our problem, though, is that we think knowing this truth is going to somehow help us. But the problem is Paul knows this, and he's trying to help us see this. Knowing that God knows what you're going through will not bring any sort of help or transformation for you. Paul says you're on your way. There's a place where you can go. You can learn peace, but you have to talk to God. Because knowing these truths is not what changes you. It is not what brings peace. God brings peace. Prayer is very simply conversing with God, connecting with God. I know Brittany. If me and Brittany never talk to each other, what do you think is going to happen to our marriage? It will absolutely fall apart. And I know her. 
I could act in ways that I know that she wants me to act. I could do the things that I know she wants me to do. I could leave notes and do all this stuff. But if I never speak to her, that's problematic. And the source of our life isn't knowing things about God. Ask Judas. The source of our life is actually being in relationship with God. Knowing him and being known by him. And I love that Paul doesn't just give us something to know. If you're worried, then know this about God. He says, if you're worried, then talk to God about it. Make that situation known. But God already knows it. Yes, but be known by him in it and know him in it. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Know him. And that will help you be on your way. And I love that Paul's promise is that the peace of God will do something. The peace of God. This is, this is a little challenging right here, okay? Because this, uh, this is me, okay? Paul doesn't say, and God will change your circumstances. Hallelujah. Where are all my grateful saints? That's not what he says. Paul doesn't say, God will change your circumstances. Or in the words of Elder John, or just John, are we looking for relief or are we looking for rest? Do we want God to take us out of where we are, or do we want God to be with us where we are? Elizabeth Elliot said it best in her book, Keep a Quiet Heart. She said, and this is one of my favorite quotes of all time, please hold on to this. The secret is Christ in me, not me in a different set of circumstances. She cooked on that one. She did. And my question for you is, do you want that like all transcending peace, that peace that is just above anything that you could really comprehend, is that something that you want? Because you can have that. Paul says the way to it is just simply prayer, talking with God. The problem, I think, is that I would, God in heaven. I would rather, usually, I would rather spend a little bit more energy to try to find out a little bit more information to see if I could make a little bit more sense of the situation that I'm in. And maybe I could find about three or four different ways that I could come at it. And then I'm going to tell Brittany, you know, I got these. And then I'm going to tell everybody that, you know, this is what I'm thinking I'm going to do. And the whole time, have I ever asked God a thing about it? Have I ever told him, hey, man, I got this problem? The short answer is yes, but I'm playing to the, you know, sometimes I struggle a little bit to get there. It takes me a couple minutes. And maybe the same is true for you. But the problem is that sometimes I would rather trade the peace that transcends my understanding for going and just getting my own understanding. As a matter of fact, let me ask you one question. I need to slow down. I'm talking about pace and I'm in a hurry. If God gave you the option, really think about this. If God gave you the option, Elena. Would you rather have peace knowing me and peace knowing that I've got you no matter what? Or would you rather understand your situation and understand the way out of it? You say peace if we were honest. <laughs> Elena's being honest. Elena loves God. Elena's being honest. But uh, for the rest of us, <laughs> if we were being honest, not based on our answer, but based on our actions. What's our answer? Do we want peace? Or do we just want to know how it will play out? Because we live in the information age. Our society is obsessed with control. Obsessed. We control everything. <laughs> everything. From our phone. I just, it's bananas. But we still haven't figured out how to control all of the outcomes of our lives. I wonder why we're so anxious. I love that he says peace will stand guard. It's as if you choose to enter into God's presence. And you're sitting with God and he's like, hey, hold on just a second. Hey, peace, can you go guard the door real fast? Can you just go stand at the door? I got, hey, I got a couple bouncers. Hold on, hold on. They're going to go stand outside your heart. They're going to go stand outside your mind. They're going to make sure that nobody intrudes on, on this space. It's just you and me. That quiet place with God. God cares enough about you that he will put guards outside to protect you. He will hold you down while you kneel down and spend just a little bit of time with him. Such, such good news. 
Here's, here's a part of the problem, though, man. Oh, is that sometimes I think instead of being guarded by God, Pastor Jerry, we would, be, we would rather be guarded from God. We're guarded with God. We're like, look, 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 God, I, like I know that you could have it, but like I really have this desire over here. I really have this plan that I want to carry out. And if I let you into it, you might snatch that thing from me. And I don't know if I'm ready to let go of this thing yet. Or, you know what, God, you know my circumstance, but you allowed me to get here. It's your fault that I'm in this situation in the first place. And if you cared, you would have snatched me out of this situation and switched it up. But, but you're leaving me here, so you know what? I can't really talk to you about it right now because I don't know if you love me as much as I love me because you're letting me be here, and I'm going to throw this whole tantrum, this whole fit, thinking that I know best. I don't want peace. I say I want peace, but I wonder if I really want peace. And remember, I'm not there yet, but, but I'm on my way. If you feel like I'm in your pocket, guess what? I'm in 70 pockets right now. I'm in everybody's pocket right now. Call me iPhone. I'm just here right now. And, and, and it's okay because you know what? We're not there yet. But we're on our way. Paul wasn't there yet. And he's the, we, I'm about to get to Paul. I'm about to talk about Paul. Remember I said you can learn peace. This is learned. It's not just by prayer. Prayer is a part of the, the situation, a part of what's offered to us. Paul in verses 8 and 9 says a couple more things. Look at verse 8. He says, whatever is, and he gives you a list. And then he says, if there is, and he gives you a couple more things. And then he says, dwell on these things. Dwell on these things. Now, dwell is a fancy word for just like hang out. He's saying, I want your mind to kick back with these things. I need you to fill your mental, protect your chickens, right? I need you to fill your mentality. I need you to fill your mind with these things. Now listen, I know you've got all this other stuff to think about. I know you've got all this stuff that you're trying to fix. I know you've got all this stuff you've got to solve. However, dwell on these things. You see, here's what I know about being anxious or being worried or having anxiety. This is part of the problem of being in the information age is that we kind of know all the outcomes. It's like either I get the promotion or I don't. That's maybe a little easier. But like when the kid's out late, they got the car and they're, they're, they're out past curfew. You kind of know the outcomes, but then you kind of don't. And you're just sitting in the house like, I'm going I'm to just bust them in the head when they get home. They are done for. But I really wish they were home right now. I'm so worried. I love them so much. Or when they hide, you know. Anyway, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was just thinking about that. It was like, this is similar. And we are so caught up. We don't know, but then we do know, and that just causes us so many things. And he says, look, I know you could, you could think about all the potential outcomes, but that's not going to lead you anywhere close to the presence of God. Or what you could do, oh my God, you could bring all those potential outcomes to God which might lead you to being filled with some of his truth, some of his character, and you could ponder those things, you could meditate on those things, and maybe that might lift you up a little bit, but he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, I want you to pray, and I want you to ponder. He says, wouldn't you know it, look at verse 9, he says, what you have learned, hold on to that, and received, and heard from me, and seen in me, these things practice. Paul said practice. We talking about practice? Yes, Paul's talking about practice. There are some things that Paul wants you to put into play. You could kind of make some arguments. It could be that the list in verse 8, those things to think about, you put those things into practice. That's a fair argument. It could be, Paul says, all the stuff that I've handed down to you, the kind of apostolic faith, the tradition, all the teachings, I want you to put those things into practice. They're very similar. Take your pick. What Paul's concern is, is that you might pray and then get up and go do whatever it is that you want to do. Or you might have a moment where you think on these things, but then you go and you do whatever you want to do. Paul says, when you've been with me, 
when you think about me, when you're caught up in all of the truths, all of the promises, all of the assurances, all those things that I could provide for you, something's got to give, something changes. You're not there yet, but you are on your way. That's what Paul is saying. And the promise that he says is not just that you will have peace, not just that God will give you his peace, but that the God of peace will be with you. And let me ask you a question. If everything that was going on right now that you are stressed out by, I'll give you my own situation. If my kids let me get out of the house on time in the morning and they were happy and they never threw a fit, just no tears, no yelling, no throwing toys, no hitting, no taking from your brother. I got a lot of things on the kid list, okay? I could just sit here for a while. If that was fixed, if we were in a house, if I knew when my sabbatical would be, if I had a person over all these things, if I had this conflict that was taken care of, if I had all of that taken care of, but I didn't have the God of peace with me, would my life really be all that much better or would I just find something else to dive into to say, oh, the sky is falling. I would just find more stuff. Or I could learn peace. You can learn peace. It can be yours. For free 99, you ain't got to pay. There's no, but wait, there's more. It doesn't exist. You can learn this. I want to make a point of it. If you leave with one thing, I want you to leave with this. You can learn peace. You can learn it. It's, oh, I didn't have this before I preached a sermon, and I found this, and I'm like, I'm going to hold on to this forever. You can learn peace. Look at verse 9. He says, do what you have learned. When this word is used here, the way Paul intends it to be learned is that you have gained some knowledge by instruction. Like you've been in the classroom and you've been inculcated and now you're ready to move. Go put it into practice. But Paul uses the same term a couple verses later. Look at verse 11. I don't say this out of need, talking about how they gave him support and he's grateful, for I have, what's that word? Uh-oh. I have learned to be content. When Paul uses learned here, what he means, let me see, oh, I have the definition. This is what, this is what the Greek lexicon says. It's not the only one, it's just the best. If you ask me, it doesn't matter, I'm going to just keep moving. To come to a realization with implication of taking place less through instruction than through experience or practice. Oh my God, Paul says, I've put this into practice. I've made it my own. If you cut me, I'm bleeding this because I've practiced it. I have learned to be content. Paul didn't just meet Jesus and all of a sudden it was like, oh, I'm content. He may give that, but Paul here is telling on himself. Old Paul was a lot more humble than young Paul, but I don't, I feel weird saying that, but it is what it is. And old Paul said, listen, I've learned to be content. Not I've always been this way. Not I asked God for it and he gave it to me, but I have learned to be content. Contentment is the low side of peace. Joy is the high side. So Paul also says, rejoice in the Lord. Not in your circumstance, but in Jesus. And you can learn how to do that. Let me just give you one more piece. Paul meets Jesus just a few years after the crucifixion and resurrection. And Paul, which is like, let's say, A.D. 35. Paul writes this letter probably around A.D. 61 or 2. That's like two and a half decades. Paul's learned this. Now, if I tell you, guys, listen, if you put this sermon into practice in 25 years, you're going to be who you want to be right now listening to this sermon. But you know what the alternative is? If you don't put this into practice, who are you going to be in 20 to 25, 30 years? We're losing a generation to Facebook and identity politics. Faithful disciple makers are gone, caught up, because they weren't getting caught up in Christ. They get caught up in all this other stuff. Because some political figure wants to tell us, like, I've got all the answers. No, you don't, cousin. 
You don't. Vote. Be a part of, of, of civic life. However, Jesus, the U.S. will not last forever, and it has not been around forever, but Jesus and his kingdom will never end. So go, go vote again and again. But please know that voting is not learning. It just isn't. If you want to learn this, you can learn peace. And if you want to, then train. Don't try. When you get into a situation where you need peace, don't try to white-knuckle your way into it. Don't try all of a sudden. Today, train. Do one peace push-up. Tomorrow, do two peace push-ups. The next day, do three peace push-ups. And then when a burden that is heavy and you don't know if you can bear it comes along, you'll have 30 days of push-ups behind you. And you'll be a little bit more ready. And guess what? If it crushes you, Jesus is strong enough to heal you. And your community can come alongside you. And you can train again. You didn't fail. You didn't try. That was just training. Hey, we don't take L's. We learn lessons, right? So now I'm going to get up and I'm going to do 31 push-ups because i got to be ready for the next one. And by the time you hit 60 or 70 or 80, maybe you would say, you know, I'm not quite there yet, but I'm not where I was and I'm still on my way. And that is what Paul says, and it's the promise that he makes to you. Let me give you one more thing, and I'm going to get out your hair, I promise. Let me give you one more thing. Paul says in verse 12, I've learned the secret. I've learned the secret of being content. He's taking shots at the Gnostics who were saying that you could, uh, you could, uh, you could leave all of like the material worries. It was basically Buddhism. Like it wasn't, but it was similar. You can leave all of this, detach from all of this, be less of an individual, lose yourself in, like, the universe, achieve nirvana. Like, don't worry about you. Don't worry about your pain. Don't worry about your struggle. What I love about Jesus is that I really, I'm convinced there's no better philosophy. There's no better take. Nothing makes you more you, but also helps you to be a part of a family, but also helps you care for the earth, but also know that, like, Jesus is going to come back and just completely make it new. But also, I know that I, I, wait a second, I don't have to run away from what's hard. I don't have to be an escapist. I can press into the hard and know that Jesus is with me no matter what. It's like I'm liberated. I can't lose. And when Paul says content, the word is self-sufficient. Paul says, I've learned the secret of being self-sufficient because that was the term that they would use. The other, man, the other like mystery religions were saying, hey, do you want to be, do you want to be enough? Do you want to have what it takes? Come and follow us. We'll help you learn the secret. And Paul says, no, 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 I've learned the secret to being self-sufficient. It's verse 13. Man, I'm out your hair. I am able to do all things. How many of you would like to wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, I'm able to do all things? I'm able, to, I'm able to face whatever God puts in front of me. I've got it. Paul doesn't have an affirmation. He has an assurance. No, no shade to affirmations. It's just that he has assurance that I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Jesus being with you is your strength. And Jesus is giving you strength to keep going no matter what you face. And so this year, next year, the year after that, how do you develop impenetrable peace so that when you're 60, when you're 80, this could mark you? How do you get there? Practice God's presence. It's really all I've got for you. Practice God's presence. Practice God's presence by praying. Talk to him. Don't just know about him. Talk to him. But don't just pray. Ponder. Practice God's presence by pondering. Y'all thought I was going to let you out without alliteration. You're crazy. What this looks like in community, pray for one another and pray together. When it comes to pondering, check one another's mental maps. How's your processing? How's your thinking? Are you believing lies? Actually, like, get into the nitty-gritty together. Don't just let one another get lost in all of the almost truths out there. And give one another truth. And practice God's presence by your patterns, your rhythms, your habits. This is what I'm going to be doing this week. I'm going to be reassessing. 
I am going to be practicing God's presence by praying, by pondering, and by practicing or by my patterns. Because I know I'm not there yet, but I'm on my way. So am I practicing God's presence? Am I praying? Is are those moments of anxiety signaling me to pray? And do I? I'm not above getting help. This is just my process. Am I meditating on God's truth or am I thinking about all of the worst case scenarios and all the things that need to get done and all of what I'm going to drop if I'm not as productive as 17 people? Am I holding rhythms that are proportionate to my output or does something need to change? That's what I'm doing. What are you going to do this week? I want you to join me. I want you to... Practice God's presence by praying, by pondering, and by assessing your patterns. So as we contemplate, usually we have some questions that we ask, but my questions are, which of those three are the the hang-up that you have? Is it prayer? Is it your thought life? What you're dwelling upon, what you ponder? Or maybe it's your practices, maybe it's your patterns, it's your pace that's, that's too fast for the the practices of spiritual discipline that you have to be connected to Jesus? Ask that question, and whatever your answer is, find somebody in your life group, someone in your huddle, someone on the road down from you, or come down here and ask for prayer and talk it out. But don't leave it at that. Get to the end of it. And here's a a cheat code, you'll never get there because I'm not there yet. Amen. I love you all. especially today, because it is the 14th anniversary of my brother's death. Um, And I didn't realize how much I've been dreading this day until I realized today that I've been mentally stuck on March 7th because I didn't want to get here. Um, And that was expounded on Friday I was looking for his obituary, which I've had and known exactly where it was for 14 years and I couldn't find it. I broke down. And it's just been a very stressful situation for me. And then Ryan starts talking about not worrying, about not being anxious. And it's the reminder for me that even though today is the anniversary of his death, it's also a beautiful day for me because it was the beginning of my walk with Christ. I was living a very self-destructive lifestyle um, leading up into his death. And at his funeral, when everybody was talking about how much he helped, how much he was there, how much he gave, even in the midst of his illness he died of brain cancer even in the midst of that he was consoling other people about his passing Um, I had decided in that moment that I would honor him by trying to emulate his life and six months later is when I gave my life to Christ and so it's that reminder for me that in this space I should not be stuck on the fact that he died. I should 
be ruminating on the fact that God gave me life. He's my living hope. He's the one that saved me. He is the one um, that brought me to where I am today. I literally would not be here today if not for that moment. So as you stand with us and sing, I just pray that we listen and, and ruminate on what it is that Ryan has talked to us about, to not be worried, to not be anxious, to accept that God has given us peace that defies all understanding.
have a couple people coming up, and uh, they're going to share. Come on, you too, Pastor. Come on. They're going to share something that's coming up. If uh, if that pondering piece, that meditating piece is where you get hung up, I think this might be for you. Or maybe you just have all the scriptures in the world in your head. Maybe this is for you too. Well, I'm going to let them talk. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. No, um. The Ba family, man, they did something, was it this year or last year? Last year. Last year. They did something last year, man, that I thought was just amazing. Uh, and it was a, a, a Bible bee. Any spelling bee champions in here? That this? Oh, okay. All right, we got one. Any other spelling bee champions? What about people who learned their whole entire Wana books? Look at that. You got a scholarship at DBU for learning? <laughs> But, man, they did this, man. It was their own personal thing, man. But I thought it was something that, A, is indicative of our church, rightly dividing the Bible. But I also thought it was something, man, that allows us to be responsible siblings. And so I wanted to give them the stage to talk about the Bible B um, here at Disciple City Church. So it's on you. Hey, DCC fam. My name is Brandon again. I'm Brandon. This is my beautiful wife, Marika. Marika. Yeah, so... The Bible be, everybody get up for the Bible be. Clap it up for that, clap it up. Let's clap it up for actually like learning the word of God. So one, one big thing for us, one of our values is being people of the book um, in our family. And so learning the Bible is something that's been really, really dear to us. Man, there's so many voices out here, Instagram, um, YouTube, everyone's got something to say. What about God's word? And we know that God's word is living and breathing and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So it's important for us to get that word in us. And so in a couple of months, we're going to give you guys three months to learn 60 scriptures. Now, I know some of us are like, 60 scriptures? I can't learn 10. The thing is, it doesn't matter if you can learn 5 or 20 or 60. The goal is for all of us to look more like Jesus. And we believe that if we get God's word in our hearts, right, he says, may I put his word in our hearts that we may that we may not sin against him, right? And so it's important for us to do that. Marika, can you share with us why it's important for us to learn God's word? Yeah, um, so I have five reasons here why we think it's very important. So number one, we use the word of God to combat the lies of the enemy. We see Jesus doing this in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 11. Also, we're more equipped to encourage our siblings. It's not a TED talk, but we're pointing our siblings back to the word of God. Three, the Holy Spirit is able to use his scriptures to challenge us to grow to look more like Jesus. Four, the word of God is powerful and it transforms us. And number five, God's word teaches us to be more like him, like Ryan shared. <laughs> um, Ryan mentioned knowing him and being known by him. And also understanding that it's a beautiful journey when we are known by God and to be known by him. Um, I lost my dad two years ago, and the journey of grief has been super challenging. But scriptures has pointed me to one, remember, I'm gonna see him again because he died in faith, and two, growing to grieve well through the word of God. So yeah, we, we encourage you guys, we challenge you guys to come out, sign up. So next steps look like, um, Signing up on Church Center if you're interested, or coming to talk to me or Brandon or our pastors to get more information. Yeah, we'll so talk to you out. Talk we hope you me. guys join. It's going to be really exciting, guys. So please, please join up. Um, uh, we're going to have buzzers. It's going to be food. It's going to be a great time. So definitely like see you guys come out. Think of Family Feud, but with the Bible. Uh, yeah. I'm telling y'all, man, like this. Oftentimes when DCC does things like Revive or now Elderly Prayer, when we did Fellows, the things that have stuck are the things that we did together and the things that equipped us for family life, 
for neighboring life, and also to combat the enemy. And I think the Bible Bee is one of those things that's going to equip us in a world, and I think Brandon said it best, in a world that is constantly flooding us with information, but we don't have the theological equipment or the memorized truth in our hearts to combat those things. So I'm saying, let's do this. Now, one of the things that we want to do it in the context of life groups so that you're doing it together, but that will be based on how many people sign up, right? So if you all sign up according to life group because the registration is is linked up like that, you'll see your life group on there, then that will help us. We can partner life groups together. Even if you wanted your child to be a part of the life group and do I'm just going to tell you, my daughter, Nasia Wagner, I'm going to put her on black. She says she's going to win. Y'all laughing. She, she was dead serious. She says she is going to win. So even if you wanted your child to remember a couple of verses and bring them on stage, that's fine. You know, but we will have child care, things of that nature or whatever. But please go sign up. You have roughly a little over three months. Yeah, a little over three months to um, know your verse. Every translation is available unless it's heretical. All right, you can't use the Queen translation or the uh, Gen Z translation. You can't use those translations. But any other translation is, is, is up for grabs and you can use those. Even the message, you can use the message translation. I also wanted to say, uh, so if you read and memorize the scripture every three days, that'll put you right in line for being ready for it. Um, if you're trying to be more aggressive, you can learn one every day and be done in two months. So yes, yeah, something else to That's say. Good. Any other? I just got to benedict us. Can y'all give it up for the boss, please? The incentive, the, well, I wasn't saying get off. Y'all can stay, y'all can go. It's okay. Uh, the incentive uh, to sign up is to have more time probably. But Church Center, if you're a guest, thanks for being here. We have the connect table back here. You can get to know somebody that can give you what you need. Guys, thanks for being with us. Let me get us out of here. Now, may the love of God and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit go with his people now and forevermore. Let all God's people say, go hug somebody that don't look like you before you leave this place.